All right, we're going to work with some inverse trig functions. Uh, first uh, note, uh, depending on the text you may have used in pre-calculus and Calc 1, um, they, you know, you might see this notation for the inverse. In this case, it's written as the inverse sign, but this, you know, superscript negative one, you know, to indicate the inverse function. Um, and in these notes and in our textbook, uh, the Larson text, we will almost exclusively use the arc sign notation. So you're going to see that more than, than anything else. Um, they mean the same thing, right? They're just different ways to denote the same thing. But uh, but we're going to be using the arc notation. I'm I'm going to be using that in these notes and in these videos. Um, so in order for these inverse trig functions to be well defined, we actually need to restrict the domain of the respective trig functions. So um, the arc sine, you know, we define the arc sine function, for example, in this way. We say, well, arc sine of x is equal to y if and only if sine y is equal to x, right? This does what an inverse function is supposed to do in that it kind of swaps the roles of the input and output. Um, so the arc sine function will tell you for what angle does sine give this particular value. Um, the, the, the reason that we have to restrict the domain is because, of course, if I think about zero, right, where is sine equal to zero? Well, sine is equal to zero at, at zero, but also at pi, and at 2 pi, and at 3 pi, and at 4 pi, and at 5 pi. So we not only need to restrict it to one go around the circle, but even with one go around the circle, you see a lot of uh, values uh, repeated. So um, we fix that by saying that the range, the, the values that the arc sine function is going to spit out, will be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Basically, this is the right half of the circle. Now, I'm going to say a couple of things. One, you'll note that when we restrict ourselves to the right half of the circle, we do get all possible values of sine. Sine is the y-coordinate. So if I look at just the, the right half, we do get every possible y-coordinate. We don't get all the x-coordinates, but that's fine. We get all the y-coordinates. Um, so in, in each y-coordinate, just once. Uh, the other thing I'm going to say is, you know, we said we're restricting it to the right half, and you might be wondering, well, why is it, you know, doesn't, doesn't the right half include 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, right, in this bottom part? Um, and what we do is instead of calling this 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, we think of it as going from 0 backwards, and we think of this as negative pi over 2. And the reason that we do that is that the range of this function is now a continuous interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Um, so we restrict the, the arc sine range to the right half, we also do that for arctan as well. Um, and and arc cosecan for, for, for the record. Um, if arc sine spits out values, then naturally arc cosecan will spit out values in that uh, same range. Um, the other functions, if I look at arc cosine, defined in the same way, right? We need the domain to be negative 1 to 1 because those are all the values that cosine can spit out. We restrict that range to the top half of the circle, 0 to pi. arc cosine on, on the top half, also uh, arc cotan and, and arc secant. As far as um, inverse trig functions goes, you will see primarily uh, arc sine, arc cosine, and arc tan to be the ones that are used uh, most often. So 
um, again, if we have some convenient values, you know, we can use the unit circle to help us out with these. Um, it says evaluate the following, arc sine of negative a half. Well, we can um, use the calculator, right, and the inverse uh, function on the calculator. It would give us an approximation because, uh, you know, it's in radians, it's in terms of pi. But I think it's a little easier to just use the unit circle. So negative a half is right here. Now, of course, this says 11 pi over 6, but I know that's the same as going backwards, pi over 6. So that's a negative pi over 6. And it's really important to note that arc sine of negative a half is negative pi over 6, and that's it. 11 pi over 6 is not correct because um, that's not the, in the range of values for arc sine. Now this next one's a little bit trickier. We want arctan of root 3. Arctan, you know, I don't just look for coordinates, right? The x coordinate is cosine, the y coordinate is sine. So tangent is actually the quotient of those coordinates, right? It's y over x. So um, what I'm going to do first is just to kind of help myself think about it as I'm going to say, I'm going to call this x. Whatever it is, it's x, and I'm looking for x. And if arctan of root 3 is equal to x, then that means that tan of x is equal to root 3. And so I'm going to just use the definition of tangent in terms of sines and cosines. I'm going to rewrite it. Sine x over cosine x equals root 3. Now that's giving me um, uh, a place to go or some values to check at least. First of all, it's a positive root 3, so I'm going to check the first quadrant. I know it's somewhere in the first quadrant. And, and I need the quotient, right, the ratio of those values to be root 3. So I need, if the, if the ratio of sine over cosine is root 3, I need sine to be bigger. And, and basically, I guess that knowing that it's root 3, it helps me narrow it down to either this or this, right? That's where I see root 3 show up in the coordinates at all. Um, but I think sine has to be bigger. So I'm going to check pi over 3. So sine, I'm doing a little uh, margin work here. So sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. Cosine pi over 3 is a half. And those cancel, and we do get root 3. So as it turns out, um, this means that uh, x is equal to pi over 3. That's the angle. Um, next, we get some handy inverse properties. We do have to be a little bit careful about domain and range uh, issues. So sine of arc sine of x. You know, if a function meets its own inverse, they annihilate each other, and you just get the argument, right? So sine of arc sine of x is just equal to x, right? These guys annihilate each other. Similarly, arc sine of sine of y is just equal to y. Now, that's if y is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And likewise, up top, that's only if x is between negative 1 and 1. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful. Here I've just written the properties for sine and arc sine, but it's true for every function with its corresponding inverse function. Um, so sine of, uh, sorry, arc sine of sine of pi. Now, we have to be careful because we're tempted to look at this and say, well, an inverse, you know, a function is meeting its inverse, and so they should just annihilate each other, and we get pi. But in fact, that's not how this is going to work out. Um, sine of pi is equal to zero, so this is arc sine of zero, and arc sine of zero is zero. Um, so here we ran into, this is an illustration of needing to be careful about the domain and range problems. Uh, arc sine of sine of y is equal to y only if y is already in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and pi is outside that range. Um, we could solve equations just by using the um, inverse property or the definition of the inverse function. Arctan of 2x minus 3 is equal to pi over 4. Well, that means that um, uh, tan of pi over 4 
is equal to 2x minus 3. Now tan of pi over 4 is equal to 1. And now, now we have a really simple equation, right? This is a linear equation. We could solve this, uh, you know, without any trouble at all. We divide by 2 and we get x equals 2. Right, but first we just had to apply the inverse property um, to transform the equation. All right, let's solve another one. Uh, it says given y equals arc sine x, where y is between 0 and pi over 2, find cosine y. So, you know, they tell us arc sine of x is equal to y, and they say find cosine of, of y. Uh, and what we're going to get is not going to be a numerical value, right? They haven't given us enough specific information, um, any any known actual values to, to get a numerical value. Uh, so it'll be an algebraic, it'll be some expression that with y, x and y. But they tell us that y is equal to arc sine x. So if y is equal to arc sine x, that means that uh, x is equal to sine of y. And so I'm going to draw a right triangle. I'm going to kind of distinguish this angle down here, and I'm going to call that angle y because that's the angle inside of sine. And if sine y is equal to x, that means that this is equal to the opposite over adjacent, right? That's uh, opposite over hypotenuse. That's x over 1 is opposite over hypotenuse. So this is x, this is 1. You can use Pythagoras. and find that this side here is the square root of 1 minus x squared. And now I can use the triangle and find that cosine y is the square root of 1 minus x squared over 1, or just the square root of 1 minus x squared. All right, let's do another one. They tell us that y is equal to arc secant of root 5 over 2. So that means that secant of y is root 5 over 2. And from there, we could say, if I know what secant is, that means cosine is its reciprocal. Cosine of y is 2 over root 5. This is adjacent over hypotenuse. So my angle is y adjacent over hypotenuse 2 over root 5. Again, using Pythagoras. Two squared plus, I guess I'll call this a, a squared is equal to root 5 squared. Doing out the algebra here we find that a squared is equal to 1, so a is 1, and we want tan of y. Now use Sokotoa in this right triangle, opposite over adjacent is 1 half. Let's do a couple more problems. We're going to find some derivatives. Uh, first, uh, we'll find the derivative of y equals arc sine of root x. Now, uh, these formulas are ones that are on uh, one of those sheets at the beginning of the prop uh, of the chapter with some trig facts. So, um, the derivative of arc sine of u is one over the square root of 1 minus u squared times du dx. So 
So in this case, u is the square root of x. So dy dx is 1 over the square root of 1 minus root x squared times, now the derivative of the square root of x. The square root of x is x to the 1 half, so that derivative is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. And now we're going to simplify. one over, let's see, I've got a two in the bottom and I also have this factor of square root of x in the bottom because of the negative exponent. And then that's times the square root of one minus x. And we could write this now with a single radical. So dy dx equals one over two times the square root of x times 1 minus x. You could leave it like that, or some people like to distribute that x and say square root of x minus x squared. Um, same thing. It, however you like to write it is fine. Okay. Let's do one more. We're going to find the derivative of this function, y equals arc sine x plus x times the square root of 1 minus x squared. So the first term, arc sine x, you know, we're just going to apply that formula for the derivative of arc sine x, and there's not even any chain rule to worry about because the argument is just x. Um, this other term, though, we're going to need to use the product rule. Um, so for the product rule here, f is equal to x, and so f prime is 1 g is equal to 1 minus x squared to the 1 half power. And so g prime is 1 half 1 minus x squared to the negative 1 half power, implying the power rule there. And then the chain rule says times a negative 2x. That's the derivative of what's inside. We can do some simplifying. 2 with the 1 half, so it's still negative though. So we have negative x over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, so this is sort of the side work to get the derivative of that second term. Now let's put this together here. So dy dx is equal to, first I'm going to deal with that arc sine term. So that's 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Plus, now the power, uh, sorry, now the product rule. g times f prime plus f times g prime. g times f prime, that's, uh, let's see, the square root of 1 minus x squared times 1 plus x, f, which is equal to x, times g prime, negative x over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Now, here, I'm just going to say you have a bit of a choice, and, and right now I've written everything with radicals. Some people will really prefer to write everything with um, the one-half exponent. Um, I'm going to leave everything in radical form and get a common denominator is how I'm going to approach this. If you wanted to use exponents, uh, one-half and negative one-half exponents on everything, um, then you could factor out the you know, greatest common factor. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat this like um, a fraction. I'm going to get a common denominator. So I have to multiply, this middle term needs to get multiplied by the radical 1 minus x squared on the top and the bottom. And now they all have the same denominator. Up top I've got 1 plus, then I'm multiplying this radical by itself, so that's 1 minus x squared. And then this, uh, our last term here, 
will actually be a negative x squared. Let's keep going. We've got now 2 minus 2x squared over the square root of 1 minus x squared. We can take out a factor of 2 up top. And um, we're almost done, but not quite. Um, you could, I mean, you see this, right? We have this common factor of one, uh, one minus x squared. So there's a couple of different ways you could think about it. I'm going to choose to write out this uh, one minus x squared up top. I'm going to write that as the square root of one minus x squared times the square root of one minus x squared. Just because it makes it really obvious now, I think, that I can cancel all these factors. You can also do it by using properties of exponents if you think of this being to the first power and at the bottom being to the one-half power. Um, but now that we've canceled those, our final result is 2 times the square root of 1 minus x squared.